All right, so we're going to try to continue a little bit more with R2. I don't know if we'll finish today or not. It doesn't look like we will. Looks like we've got quite a bit left on R2, but we will keep going on it. Let's see, this period is 1025. I got 20 minutes. Okay. That should be good. So the first word, I mentioned this. Oops, I forgot to do this. I wish it would automatically go to this, but I got to do this every time. There we go. Let's talk about this word. We've talked about this already, but here's the first time they officially talk about it. Talk about a variable. What in the world is a variable? Well, a variable is just a letter, okay? So you could use X, you could use Y. They're really common variables. A, B, and C are common variables, but you can use any letter of the alphabet. In fact, the higher up you go in math, they, they quit using letters of the English alphabet and they go to the Greek alphabet and they have a bunch of letters in the Greek alphabet that you're gonna learn, okay? So um, by the time, if you are a math major, by the time you finish being a math major, you pretty much know the whole entire Greek alphabet because there's so many things that are represented by Greek letters in the alphabet. But right now, we're just gonna stick with the English letters and um, those are just examples of letters. But they're not just letters. What do they do? They represent what? They represent numbers, okay? So if you want to write that down, you can write that down. So represents numbers. And you've learned that since pre-algebra, haven't you? Did you have pre-algebra? At least in Algebra 1, right? You learned what variables were. So that's, that's just what that is. So that's just official. I think I mentioned this word one time yesterday, but you may not remember. Okay, that's a constant. So a variable... Like X could represent any number at all. Y could represent any number at all. Same thing with A, B, C. Any letter could represent any number. But a constant is something a little different. What is a constant? It's just a number. It's just a, a number. And it means something specific. So somebody give me a number. Eight. Okay, eight would be considered a constant. Because it's always going to be eight. It's not going to change. X could change, couldn't it? Okay, in one problem, X could equal one thing. In another problem, X could equal something else. But eight is always going to be eight. All right, with me on that? Okay. Uh, you could also have like negative numbers, like negative seven. That's still a constant, still a number. It's on the number line, okay? That would be a constant. Um, Mr. Rao, the square root of two, would you consider that a constant even though? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's So even though it keeps on going? Yeah. Right, okay. Right, right. So, yeah, so that was that would be my question right there. So it's nice to have Mr. Rowan here, so if I get stuck, I can always <laughs> go, to the, go to the man that knows it all. So it's an irrational number, which we're not going to talk about right now. Later on, we will. Um, but it's still just a regular number, okay? Even though, if you put it in your calculator, it'll take up all the space on your calculator because it keeps on going forever and ever, all right? It doesn't repeat but it just kind of randomly, it does, it's not random, but anyway, it just, it looks like it's random numbers just keep on going. What's another irrational number that you use a lot? You use in geometry a lot. Seven's a constant. Seven is just a regular number. It's a rational number. Pi is a number. What's, what's pi? We know it as 3.14, but it keeps on going, doesn't it? 3.14159, you know? Okay. I, all I know is 3.14159, that's all I know. And there's really no reason to know the numbers any further than that um, because it gets so small that it doesn't make any difference. I had a kid, oh, there you go. There's, there's, there's a pie mug right there. Look at that. And then at the very end, let me guess, at the very end, oh, it doesn't. Oh, they should have put a dot, dot, dot. Okay, so it doesn't end there. It's, they didn't put dot, dot, dot. It, it's no good. It's, it's not a right mug. So anyway... It just keeps on going. It looks like they're random numbers, but they're really not. Anyway, we won't talk about that anymore. What about this? What about this thing? It's called an algebraic expression. Good. It's an algebraic expression. Basically, it's kind of like a combination of these two things, of variables and constants. It's basically what it is. There's probably more of a formal definition for that, but I'll just say it's a combination of variables and uh, constants. So, for instance, we'll do a super easy one, like x plus 3. That's an algebraic expression. All right, because it's a constant, 
or I'm sorry, it's a variable and a constant together. And there happen to be added together. Um, you could have, here's another one. I think, I think this is in the book. I can't read my writing. I think that's a one minus t, all right? So you can have division, you can have multiplication, you can have addition, you can have subtraction. That would be an algebraic expression. Here's another example, something like that, all right? And again, it's got variables and it's got constants in it. That would be an algebraic expression. So sometimes they're gonna say, like, I'm gonna give you an example in the very next thing we're gonna do. It'll say, um, what does it say? Evaluate the, the algebraic expression. And sometimes, eventually, they might just say evaluate. So if I do it, I'd probably just say evaluate. But they'll say evaluate this algebraic expression. So let's actually do that. So this is an example in the book. I don't know what page it's on, but it's example five. And it says evaluate uh, these following things if, and I'm going to give you, we're going to do like four different examples here. So we'll do an A, B, C, D. Evaluate this expression if x is equal to 3 and y is equal to negative 1. So here's the first expression. So if all I did was say this, you wouldn't be able to answer that because you have no idea what the expression is, the algebraic expression, all right? You need an expression, and here's the first one. It's x plus 3y, right? So they want to find out what is this equal to? Well, if I didn't give you what x was equal to or what y was equal to, you wouldn't be able to figure that out, all right? But now that I know what x is and I know what y is, what I can do, here's what I say. A lot of math teachers say this. I just plug them in. You ever hear a math teacher say that? Okay, you plug in that number for that x. Or I say plug and chug. I had a professor in college. He always said plug and chug all the time. That means you plug it in and then you work it out. That's the chug part, all right? So let's plug and chug. What are we going to get? So what is x? It's three, then we put a plus. Now, what is that three and that y doing to each other? They're multiplying. So in, in algebra, I usually put parentheses. I don't usually put the dots. When you get a little bit higher into math, you start using the parentheses and not the dots. Definitely not the x, right, that we used to use. Because x could get confused with what? The variable. This variable x, right, and they're two different things. So I put parentheses, and what are we going to put in the parentheses? Negative one. Now, we did teach this yesterday, right, how to simplify this kind of stuff. But now we're going to actually plug everything in and work it out. So order of operations, we do multiplication first. What's being multiplied? This 3 and that negative 1. So watch. This is how I show my work. If this was a homework problem, this is what you would do. You would put number 1 or whatever number it is. Okay. You'd write the problem. I would even write all this stuff. Everything that you see right here in front of you, this is what you should write down when you do your homework. All right? And then right there. What is the 3 times negative 1? It's negative 3. So you could put plus negative 3, or you could just put what? Minus 3, couldn't you? Isn't that the same thing as plus negative 3? Sure. So right there, and then what do we get? We get 0, and I like to circle the answer, okay? Kyle likes to highlight it in this pretty orange highlight color, but and that would be fine if you want to do that, but I like to just circle it. And technically, we should put equal signs out in front like this. This is how you should do your homework problem. Everybody got it? Yeah. Okay. Even if you could do it in your head, all right? Even if you could do it in your head, write the steps down so I can see that I know what you're doing. And that will help you in the long run. It really will. Let's evaluate this, 5xy. Now, we're still using the same value for x and the same value for y. But now, you're just multiplying stuff together, aren't you? So how do I write this step? Put it equals, put that 5, put a parentheses for the x, put a parentheses for the y. Everybody see that? Now I'm just going to plug and chug, right? Now I plug them in. So this is where the x goes, so I put a 3 right there. This is where the y goes, I put a negative 1 right there. There's no addition on this one, I just multiply them together. When you're multiplying three numbers, it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in. So I'll just do the first two. 5 times 3 is what? 15 times negative 1 is? negative 15, and I circle it, and that's how I do it. That's how you should do it on your homework. Let's do another one. 3y over 2 minus 2x. Wow, a lot of stuff going on in this one. That's supposed to be a y. It looks kind of weird. So let's plug and chug. So I write down the problem, and then what I like to do is I like to put parentheses wherever I have a variable. 
So I'm going to do that right off the bat before I even put the numbers in. If you want to stick the numbers in after you do the parentheses, that's fine, but I, I don't know, I like to do it like this. So now, what do we put in this first parentheses? A negative one, because that's what y is, okay? This is the uh, x, so what do I put in for that? A three. So that's the plug part, we plug them in, right? Now, I just work it out. So let's just do the top, then the bottom, right? Um, so let's do that, let's do the top. Three times negative one, negative three. And on the bottom, we got to do a couple things here on the bottom, don't we? Let's do it. Let's do each step. So I'm going to put the two. I got to do this multiplication, okay? This stuff right here, I have to do that before I subtract it from the two. So I put the two, put the minus, and then six. You with me? Yeah. Let's just go sideways since I don't want to go too far down the screen here. So the negative three, I'm going to keep the same. Two minus six, we have to do that. Two minus six. It's the same thing as adding the opposite. Remember we did that the other day? And then if you add them, they're different signs. You, you really subtract the two numbers, take the sign of the bigger number, which is six, so that would be negative four. We don't leave it like that, because we can simplify it just a little bit more. So what's a negative divided by a negative? It's a positive. So I'm not gonna leave it negative three over negative four, I'm just gonna leave it what? Three over four, and that's how you would leave your answer. It's not so bad, is it? You did this a ton in Algebra 1, didn't you? Yep. And let's do one more. I said there's four of them, so let's do D. So the absolute value, negative 4x plus y, absolute value. Tell you what, let's scooch this. Oops. Ah. If I can grab it. Oh. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Let's stick that down there, just so I have some room to work here. All right, couldn't do that with a whiteboard, could you? All right, negative four X plus Y. Now it's an absolute value. So we did talk about absolute value, I think yesterday, right? So do all the stuff inside of here before you worry about it coming out positive, okay? So do everything inside the absolute value. Then when you get one number in the absolute value, then you can apply the absolute value. Don't make everything in here positive to begin with, all right? You don't wanna do that. You work everything in here, and then you figure out what you're going to get. Plus, parentheses, absolute value. So let's put stuff in here. Negative 4 times x, negative 4 times 3. And then plus y, which is a negative 1. You with me? Yeah. Keep the absolute value. Negative, and we, now we do the multiplication first, right, before we do any addition or subtraction. So this is going to be negative 12. What's plus a negative 1? What's the same thing as that? It's just minus one. Now, different signs, right? If you add a negative one, it's the same as subtracting a one. All right, so you could just keep it plus negative one if you wanted to, tell you the truth. All right? Since I got a one here, make sure that absolute value bar is bigger than the one so you don't get confused and it doesn't look like an 11 or something, okay? Let's put equal signs out in front. Keep the absolute value. What's that? Negative 12 minus one. Can you do that in your head? It's negative 13. You could plus negative 1 like it was here, and that's negative 13. But this is inside an absolute value, so this is where we apply the absolute value. Now, does absolute value just change the sign of what's inside of there? No, it just keeps it what? Positive, or it makes it positive, okay? So if this was absolute value of positive 13, your answer would still be what? 13, okay? You with me on that? A lot of people get mixed up and they think you just change the sign. You only change the sign if it's negative. And that's your answer right there, positive 13. Make sense? Yeah. I'm starting to run out of time, so I gotta talk about that domain stuff, all right? I'm just gonna make this really simple for you. They give a definition and stuff, but I'm just gonna go right to example six. And we'll just kind of explain what the domain means. The domain basically means, what's the easy way to say it? It's basically what all the, what numbers can the variables be? Can they be any number in the world? Well, we, we would think that they could be, right? If I just said, give me a variable, you could give me any number in the world. But there's actually a number in this particular situation right here, this algebraic expression, there's a number that x cannot be. 
That's what we got to figure out for domain. So when it says domain, we want to find all the numbers that it can be, or you could look at the number that it cannot be. So what in the world am I saying? Here's your variable. Is there a number that X cannot be? I, I tell you what, let's pause on that one. Let's do another one. What if I said 5X? And I wanted to, fi and, and I wanted to figure out what the domain of this expression is. What number can X be? Or is there a number that it cannot be? Can you give me a number? Well, it can be a zero, because five times zero is what? Zero. And is, is zero a real number? Yeah, OK. What about a negative number? Can x be a negative number? Sure. Sure it can. Yeah, because I can multiply five by a negative number, can't I? Five times negative two is what? Negative 10. Is negative 10 a real number? Yeah. A real number is any number on the number line, OK? Now, the square root of two is not a real number. It's called an irrational number. But we'll talk about that some other time. So right here, the domain can be every single number on the number line. It can be all the real numbers. And in math, we have a little way to show all the real numbers. We don't write out all the real numbers. We don't write that. We write it, I write it like this. It's kind of like an R, but it's got like two things there. This is called the set of real numbers, all right? This is how we write all the real numbers in math language, all right? That's how we would write it. You with me on that? And so what we would say is we'd say that x, let's see how they do it here. Yeah, they do it like, there's a couple ways you could do this, but this is the way they want you to do it. Okay, you put it in a bracket, and you could say that x are all, are all the numbers such that they're all the real numbers. I know I kind of repeated myself. x is a number such that, that's what that little bar right there means, means such that x can be all the real numbers. So this is how we would write the domain. So they're going to say, what is the domain? of this algebraic expression. What does that mean? That means, what can x equal, right? x can be anything. How do we write anything? We can write, I, I shouldn't say anything. I should say all the real numbers, OK? So that's what means all the real numbers. But let's go back to this now. Can x be anything? Hmm. Remember we did a thing about division by 0? Remember I said, like, what's 5 divided by 0? Is it? It's undefined. This does not exist. This is not a real number. I'm giving you a huge hint, OK? Now, take a look at this. That's right. OK, what if x was 2? No, not 0, because if x was 0, this would be 0 minus negative 2. Is 5 over negative 2 a real number? Sure. Is it on the number line? Yeah, sure, it is. But what number is not on the number line? An undefined number, right? So what would make this into an undefined number? if x was 2. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. All right, so if x was 2, 2 minus 2 is 0, that would make it not a real number. This is what I usually do. I usually take the denominator, and I say, what cannot equal 0? The denominator cannot equal 0, correct? I'm not allowed to have 0 in the denominator. So this is my denominator. So if I was going to do some math, this is easy. We could just do it in our head. but I'm going to show you. They're not always going to be that easy. So I, I do this. I say it's not equal to 0. And then what do you do with both sides? Add a 2 to both sides. So x cannot be what? 2. So x can be any number, any real number in the world, any number on the number line, except for what? 2. All right? It can be a 0. It can be a negative number. It can be a positive number, except for 2. Because if it was 2, this would be undefined, and then that won't count. So how do we write that? I'm glad you asked. Let's write it. So we write, we usually put a D for domain. The domain equals, OK? So I'll put D equals, and then x such that x cannot equal 2. So this means this. This means x can be any number, but with a little restriction here, OK? What's my restriction? x cannot be equal to 2. That's what they're talking about when they talk about the domain. Make sense? Yeah. I wish we had more time because I'd go over one or two of those problems that you asked about. But that should help you answer those questions that we uh, went over. I'll tell you what, I'm, just, I'm not going to give you anything new. So you finish the homework that I gave you yesterday, finish those domain problems, okay? And then we'll come in and we'll take some questions 
tomorrow on that. We good? Yep. Okay.